talk about. Hub. She's quite poor. Hello, my name is Ian. This channel is all about music and art, and this is where we talk about music and art. And in this series of videos, we've been looking at what's been happening regarding music streaming in the UK. The UK government's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have been looking into the ways that the streaming platforms and other large record companies manage payments to songwriters, musicians and performers. And on the 15th of October 2020, UK Parliament published a news article stating that the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee were going to inquire into the impact of the streaming on the future of the music industry. The article stated that the inquiry would consider whether the government should take action to protect the industry from piracy in the wake of steps taken by the EU on copyright and intellectual property rights. Now I knew that uh, there were some high profile musicians and music industry types who were giving evidence to the committee. And the first of these meetings was on the 24th of November 2020 with another meeting on the 8th of December. Uh, and now these were long meetings lasting over three hours. So what I've done is I've decided to edit them down into shorter videos and the links to all the previous uh, meeting videos are in the description down below. And now we're in 2021, uh, the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee are back in session and they have two more meetings, one in January on the 19th of the 2021 and another in February the 4th. And there is another meeting scheduled for later in February. So let's have a look at the meeting from the 19th of January 2021 first. Uh, it's worth providing some background to the witnesses giving evidence to this first session. Uh, we had Peter Leatham, who is the Chief Executive of the Phonograph Performance Limited, or PPL as they are known. Now, Peter Leatham uh, joined PPL as the Head of Legal and Business Affairs in 2002, following several senior positions with the, the company since that time, I mean, including Managing Director. He was appointed to the position of CEO in January 2012, and prior to joining the company, he was a partner for eight years in the city law firm GSC Solicitors, where he specialised in intellectual property and was head of the intellectual property department. Now, if you're not sure what PPL is and what they do, they are a UK music licensing company that manages the rights for over 120,000 performers, including myself, uh, and rec recording rights holders, uh, and have been licensing the use of recorded music in the UK since 1934. So PPL licenses radio stations, TV broadcasts and certain digital media services to play recorded material in the UK. And they also license music supplied to copyright recorded music services such as in-store music systems, jukeboxes, cut and compilations of exercise classes and in-flight entertainment systems, that type of thing. And if you've ever tried to register your recordings with them, you'll know that their website is like knitting fog. But we digress. The other witness in this session was Andrea Martin, who is the chief executive of PRS for Music. Her career has been varied working for a diverse range of data focused and big subscription based organisations. She has been president and CEO of three international businesses with the Reader's Digest Association. Uh, a multimedia brand entertainment company and the managing director of data services for the Royal Mail in the UK. And I believe she was also present for ADT in Canada. And if you're not sure what PRS for Music do, um, it's a British music copyright collective. It's an un and it undertakes to collect rights management and music works on behalf of its 140,000 members of which I am one of them. And it was formed in 1997. PRS represents songwriters, composers and music publishers performing rights and collects royalties on their behalf whenever the music is played or performed publicly. Now I've been a member of PRS for over 20 years and I'm very critical of how the organisation is run but really that is a discussion for another day and not why we're here. All of the sessions for these um, committees were chaired by Julian Knight and the complete list of committee members is, and the relevant links are in the description down below. This recording is made in agreement with the UK Parliament Terms and Conditions, which states, I cannot alter the, vi the video and audio of the recording in any way. I can't use this material for satire 
or use it on a website or social media platform that promotes, encourages or facilitates illegal activity or encourages hatred and antisocial behaviour. So here is part two of session one from the 19th of January 2021 into the economics of music streaming. Damien Green. You're muted, Damien. Damien Green, you're still muted. There you we go. Thought by now, uh, we'd have all got used to this. So apologies. Uh, morning, uh, both of you. Um, Andrea, um, your submission uh, says that the music market is uh, characterised by a lack of meaningful competition, which is chilling growth and innovation. That's that's quite a strong statement. Would you like to expand on it? What uh, you know, what, what form does this take? What effect does it have? Well, I think there's, it's twofold. It goes back to um, Article 17. Um, but it also goes, if you Google or you go on to a browser and you Google free music, there's so many platforms that offer free musics that are not licensed. So there's this concept that you know, music is free, and it's that there will be few, you know free music available, and that people don't have to pay for it. And you know, these are issues that needs to be fixed for the online market to make sure that we get as much money for the creators as possible. That's one thing. That's the, the sort of attitude of mind um, that music is free, but <clears throat> it's specifically the point about competition. Um, that seems to me may well lie at, at the root of this. If you had a competitive market, then the money would flow through. There would be competition, would force you know, money through to artists, songwriters, and so on, uh, you know, whose who's, you know, concerns obviously we, we share. Um, I mean, is it the fact that you've got a, a small number of big players who have you know, many stakes in streaming services and so on, and it feels on the surface like a sort of classic definition of an oligopoly. Is, is that what you're getting at? Do you think it's that bad? Well, I, are you referring to... Um, are you the, referring the, the, the big music companies. I mean, yeah, the, the, the people who are coming up next. To the record labels on that? Just yeah. want to clarify. Right? Yeah. Yes. I think one of the things, and that's why I would have um, loved to, to, to do an introduction, um, you know, at PRS, we take care of the performing rights of the songs. We don't overlook, like Peter, um, you know, PPL overlooks at the performing and the sound recording of the songs. Um, so to, to really, this is not an issue for PRS. We focus on making sure that the copyright framework is what we have and what we make sure that our, the rights that we take care of, which is the performing rights, um, is taken care of for our members. Okay, well, maybe I should put that question to, to Peter instead. Do you worry that you're, you're trying to deal with, a, with effectively an oligopoly? You know, I, think there's, uh, I think there's plenty of competition in the market. I think one of the big problems you have is that the market peaked back in uh, 2001 for recorded music. Um, we then had Napster come along and all the years of piracy. So the, the overall music industry suffered quite a lot of decline until 2014. Now, since then, fortunately, got a better handle on piracy. I mean, at the same time as we had a sort of LimeWire, Kazaa had to be shut down, the Pirate Bay, all these different things had to be shut down. And then we've got a number of viable, uh, very popular streaming services that have come along. So from 2014, the market has grown up until you know, the most recent declared numbers in 2019. But the market back in 20, uh, 2001 was uh, 23 billion US dollars. And uh, as of 2019, it was back to 20 US billion dollars. But that's, that means that on a like-for-like on a -like basis of some real money terms, um, that 2001, 23 billion dollars is worth 33 billion. So you can see even now, we're only back to two thirds of the value of the market. And so what you have is you've got um, lots and lots of activity, lots of streaming taking place. The value of the market is that much less. 
And with so much more streaming and so much more back catalogue, so much more competition, you've got a smaller pie that everybody is fighting over. And this is why the music industry has come back at times to try and say, look, we do need support, as Andrew is saying there, in terms of the value gap and things that are happening. Because, yes, actually, it's really good. The music industry has been growing for the last few years and lots of positivity, really good demand for music. Um, but there is an, an actually licensing of the likes of um, Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Amazon, et cetera, has all gone, has been going in a good direction. But their prices have been stuck um, at the sort of £10 since the noughties. Um, you've then got some limitations there. And then also on the value gap, we're just identifying, as the tricordist explained, when you look at the 2019 US market, 51% of the streams from YouTube were 7% of the value. And that's why the whole discussion in Europe came through in terms of the value gap. That's why moving forward, we would like support that even though we're not now going to implement that uh, copyright directive from Europe, we would like to have support from government to say there clearly is an issue there still. There does need to be more liability at the ISP level to make sure that a more better deals can be done that then support the overall industry. And it's not just supporting just record companies, it's the it's the thousands of performers that are then struggling to make a living given the competition, given the lower value of the overall marketplace. And that's why, as I say, support on piracy, stopping piracy, support on the value gap are the sorts of things where we can get the industry back to a level where we actually exceed where we were back in 2001. I, I, I get, I mean, the, the, the point about eliminating piracy and, and, and the value gap, I'm sure that there'd be not much con controversy about that. But I just want to tease out, of, of, do you identify two separate problems? One, that for all the reasons you've just said, the market is still in real terms smaller than it was in 20 years ago. That, that's, that's one problem. But is there a separate problem that, if you like, too much of the money that does flow into this market uh, sticks at the sides before it gets to the performers and, and, the, and the songwriters? Do you, do you identify that as a separate problem? Or do you think that that problem is being overstated by previous witnesses we've had at this committee? Well, I think I don't, I don't, have, the direct, I don't have the direct evidence of exactly what's happening on individual uh, deals and the payments through, etc. But what you do see is that it, actually, if anything, I would say you've got a more competitive market now than you used to have, say, 10, 20 years ago. Because if you're a performer now, you can... Uh, go to a record company, you can go to a record company with all different shapes and sizes, or you can do it yourself. You can actually go and do your own releasing. You can go, if, if you know, compared to when you had a more physical market and you had to probably go through some of the record companies to get your shelf space in the, in the record store or the supermarket. So there is plenty of competition there, and there is a very broad market there, which you've got legal advisors, accountancy managers to try and advise you on the right um, route to take. Um, so overall, I think there is in the, in the marketplace and the flexibility to do what you want to do in the digital space, the, 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 option, the options are there. What you're faced with is that, as I say, you, you're faced with an overall market, which is uh, less than two thirds of what it was 20 years ago. And then you're also faced with massive competition because you've got, if you look at in 2019, two of the best selling albums were, you know, Queen Bohemian Rhapsody based on the film and Abbey Road by the Beatles, it's 50 year anniversary. So you've got this massive, so as well as trying to break a new artist and try and get your own streaming going, you've got the sort of the last 50 years of the music industry you've got to compete with in terms of trying to get yourself, your streaming, your activity. So generally speaking, it's hard, but ultimately you have got a lot of people, you've got some of the most talented people in our, in our society as performers, et cetera, are struggling to make a living because the overall economics of trying to make it all add up for the size of the market and how things operate is hard. But in a sense, that's even more bleak than the, the, the message we've had from from the performers. They all said, if you you you, know, you can change the rules a bit uh, and and you know, discuss all the details we've been discussing, uh, and they could then uh, have a chance of making a living. And what you're saying is, you know, it's just tough. It's going to be a really tough industry to to break into. So, uh, you know, but I'm, not, I'm, not trying to be, I'm not trying to be bleak. I'm not trying to say it in a way. Actually, I think that when you look at the years of growth that we've had, 2014 to 2020, music is as popular as ever. It's incredibly important to people's identity, to the culture, young culture, etc. So music is brilliant. It's, it's, it's like it's not as if it's like Kodak film that just completely there was no demand for it anymore. I had to shut down. Music is very, very popular, which is good. Um, and the demand and the increase is there, which is good. And the service is developing, which is all good. What I just want to identify is that we shouldn't forget, though, that the current size of the industry and the current you know, demands and competition makes it quite hard. But 
with the right level of support and the way that things are going, then you can continue to, you know, if the, if the market, if the value was back as it was back in 2001, there is absolutely no reason why you can't generate that value again. But as I say, um, record companies and performers need a bit of support along the way to make sure you've got the right level of copyright protection to uh, make sure you can shut down sites like Pirate Bay, or you can actually then have a value gap and make sure that some of the value of music that's been distributed around is make sure it finds its way back to performers who are you basically and songwriters that are the original creators of, uh, of, of the music. So I'm not trying to be bleak. I, mean, I think there's very good, I think for me, I think there's brilliant prospects of music going forward. And I think if you look at the UK coming out and having gone to forge its own way in the world now, if you look at um, the UK, one in every 10 streams last year was from a UK artist. So you've got a math, you've got a massive export potential. You've got, you know, where it's a, we're very, very good at music in the UK. Absolutely, we should be going. What are some of the things that are going to help us go out and uh, negotiate new trade deals and and take Britain forward in this new world? And you would look at music as being something that's respected around the world. It's massively in demand, um, and we should be trying to support it to to carry on doing that. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, Andrea, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to support what uh, Peter's saying, I think there's really three things that we need to see. We have to make sure that everybody who has on their servers are provide to our consumers that the music is licensed. That absolutely needs to happen. And these unlicensed platforms that I talk about, you know, have to be stopped because then there's the concept with consumers that music is free. And that does not help, okay? And then I think there's the piracy, you know, the, 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 the all around the stream ripping, which is a service that allows users to have unaltered copy of music that is and doesn't have to pay to the creators does not help. So, you know, it's, it, there's a couple of things that could be implemented to protect the value and making sure that our members, the songwriters, composers, and publishers are paid. And like I said, I talked about data too, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to you, Julian. Thank you, Damien. Uh, just following up, uh, just into Peter, uh, into your answer to Damien. First of all, would you be able to share the analysis you just cited about market size, especially in terms of spend per head on music? on a like-for-like -like basis opposed to global total revenue with the committee at a later date. Is that okay? Yeah, we can put some data together for you. Yeah, very happy to do that. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right, thank you. Um, just summing up what your answer was to Damien there to a certain extent, is it, is it fair to say that the financial pressures that the industry has faced, uh, the, the major decline that happened uh, in, the, in the, the decade before this, and the fact that effectively streaming has come along and uh, as well as a, a greater uh, ability to stop piracy has, has, has effectively helped the industry recover, but not recover enough. And therefore, the industry is falling back on slightly archaic means by which to ensure that their bottom line isn't affected. I'm thinking things like breakages. I'm thinking things, for example, such as the very, very sort of um, uh, opaque contracts that are seem to be abound within the industry itself is it fair to say that the, the assets have been sweated over the last few years and those assets are the, the artists themselves uh, well i think for, i think for myself I've, I've got not got direct knowledge of actually what's going on in terms of what's in what artists are signing to etc but i think that um as i said as i said before i think we you've, there is actually a very competitive market that takes place and there is good access in the uh, in the UK to artists, uh, lawyers like Tom Fredericks, who came and advised you, or uh, uh, to um, Colin Young as an accountant and, and managers, etc. So th there will be a certain amount of advice for performers to try and sign up on on sensible terms to to to, to go forward with record companies and to try and protect themselves. Um, but I think that you know, in a way, you're going to get a um, you know stronger answers from either a performer or from those from the record company side themselves as to what they're doing in terms of those deals. But as I say, I think there is there is good advice around. There are choices you can make as a performer, whether you go to the record company, whether you do it yourself, or which record company you choose. Um, and so there's that competitive market to uh, to take place. But uh, you know, as I say, I, I, I wouldn't have the direct evidence or I could give you on in terms of those artist deals. Well, I mean, one of the ones that has been cited from the committee, you've, you've seen the evidence, is the fact that 
breakages are charged in the digital age. We have breakages. Sure, that's just a means by which to the the the, the, the record companies effectively are, are boosting their profits uh, because they can see a slightly declining cake, so to speak, which is what you mentioned earlier on. I mean, it, it, it does seem to be quite staggering that the that, that artists could be charged breakages. I, I would agree with it. On the, on the face of it, I would agree with you. That just sounds like a, something that doesn't sound very sensible. But, you know, when I... But it doesn't sound sensible. It sounds, it's de- it sounds deeply unfair. Yeah, I know. But, but, but equally, I said that's where you've got to look into the overall deal-making mechanics that are going on, because quite often the artist lawyers are asking for those to be retained as they're trying to think about how they do their over, overall deal negotiations. So all I'm saying is there that I agree on the face of it, it doesn't sound like the thing you should be having. But in terms of the attempts to reform recording contracts over over time, I just know from anecdotal evidence that there, is, there are different pressures as to what the overall deal is and how you actually how you, extra, how you make the deal work. So that would be something, again, others would have to give uh, direct evidence on. OK. Uh, Andrea, YouTube has told us that over half of all revenues uh, generated by the music industry come from copyright claims made through Content ID and other tools. Do you agree with that assertion? And is YouTube doing your job, the job of rights holders? That, that's a really great point. So, yes, you know, the market has, you know, content tools and, and they're growing and increasingly competitive. But again, I go back to the, the, the point of better data in, and in this case, it's not just better data in, it's all data in and better data out, you know, and the content recognition, it depends on how it's deployed, how it's applied, you know, and, um, you know, we, as rate holders for our members, we need to be confident that the content recognition tools are being applied on all content uploaded on the services. You know, okay. and, and, and we know that our members' works are being identified, are not always identified by these recognition tools. Why is that? might want to ask um, the content ID. What do you think it is, though? What is your suspicion? Well, I think it goes back also to um, the hosting defense and the safe harbor. Mm. That needs to be updated. Right. Okay. Do you think that the tech used by YouTube um, to enforce copyright is effective, therefore? I think it's effective to a certain point, but it has to be used on all content and it has to, we have to make sure that all that content is licensed okay. before it's put on the service. Right. And when you say all content, do you mean effectively across the whole board? So, uh, visual and also. Well, I'm talking as well. about our reg holders, which is you know the the songwriters and composers of the song. Right. Okay. Thank you, Charles Watling. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 something that occurred to me is I, I'm interested in the conversations you're having with the big three. I mean, listening to some of the artists that have been before this committee, um, I, I get the impression that sometimes they feel like they're shouting into a void and not being heard. Um, I mean. Clearly, it's, interest, it's in the interest of all the majors, the big three, to make sure that the artists are properly remunerated. And, and that clearly spurs creativity and, and makes their businesses sustainable in the long run. Now, are they, are they big three, are they the big uh, music publishers in danger of killing the golden goose? Um, what dialogue are you having, Andrea? Well, we, we don't have dialogue with the record labels. We have dialogue with the publishers of the big three, Um, you know, that, and that's the dialogue that we have, not with the artist or the uh, recording label. Well, why not? I I would have thought that would have been- Because that's not what, you know, I think uh, think what's important, I would have loved to, to talk about what PRS is, but we represent the performing rights of the song. I, I, I get that. I think there might be a dialogue. The writers and the publishers that publish the songs. Okay. Okay. I, I take that. Thank you. Um, so, 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 Peter, um, if uh, music is licensed by you for TV or film and then sub to uh, social media, who is responsible under current arrangements for notifying YouTube and ensuring that enforcement takes place and that the artists are properly remunerated? 
Yeah, at the moment, so we will we will license um, a range of uh, secondary sales as you identify. So there's always been a vibrant market for you know we create very good programs and uh, uh, over in the UK. So whether it's uh, something like uh, the BBC's Top Gear, which is a massive set around the world, so we've long licensed that sort of secondary sales uh, uh, to different TV, etc., and also now on to some of the uh, streaming uh, areas. Now, we, we will license that transfer and the value that when they've got music within that and the report to us, et cetera. But that's us licensing the likes of the BBC or ITV for those. We're not licensing uh, YouTube at all. That's something that's done directly by the record company. So that other part of policing how things work with YouTube or any of the streaming platforms is, is directly done by the record companies and they'll account through to their artists as appropriate under their deals, et cetera. So, so PPL's bit is very much about licensing the original TV production, uh, the original sort of playing of those um, of those films or TV, et cetera, um, and any subsequent sale of that onto other platforms. But as I say, then the licensing of those other platforms is handled by the record companies directly. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. Um, uh, so going back to you, Andrea, uh, briefly, do you think that we talked about earlier about... Uh, piracy, uh, uh, stream ripping, um, illegitimate music streaming apps, etc. What more legislation can you quantify? I want to drill down a little further. What more legislation well, do you think? It I really think, no, specific legislation we would have to absolutely sit down and we did do already. PRS has done independent uh, research into this problem of strip, you know, stream uh, ripping in being the first in the association with the UK government, and we would be more than happy to share with the committee. But we have to make sure that this free, unlicensed platforms shouldn't be allowed. Right. You know? you said and that, and yeah. the user and the consumer, you, you know, do it your, you know, yourself. You Google free music, and there's so much, and there are many of them are unlicensed platforms. So more robust legislation, it's not a question for just in enforcement of existing legislation, you want more robust legislation. Absolutely, especially on, on streaming and, and these unlicensed platforms, it's going to be really important. Because then also the consumer is used to having free music, you know, and, and, and this free music, they, yeah. they, they don't pay the right holders. Yeah, I, we've got that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Giles. And that concludes our first panel. Uh, thank you to Peter Leatham, Chief Executive of the Phonographic Performance Limited, and Andrea Martin, Chief Executive PRS for Music, for your evidence today. We're going to take a short recess while we set up our second panel. Order, order. So thanks very much for watching. In the next video, we'll start to cover session two from the 19th of January 2021 into the economics of music streaming in which will be available in a few days. And the witnesses for that, for that meeting were Tony Harlow, Chief Executive of Warner Music UK, Jason Eiley, Chairman and Chief Executive of Sony Music UK and Ireland, and David Joseph, Chairman and Chief Executive of Universal Music UK and Ireland. So that should be a great bun fight. Take care. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers now. Bye bye.